thank you everybody for joining us and good morning from the United Kingdom. My name is Louise Elstow um, and I'm a social science researcher and emergency management specialist based in the UK along with Ian Darby, a physicist who you can see on the screen below. Give us a good wave Ian please. Hello, morning. And so in typical Scottish fashion he's crossed his arms um, based in Scotland, we'll be hosting the second part of this Safecast 10 event. Uh, today, we are commemorating um, both, uh, sadly, the tragic events that took place in Japan 10 years ago, as well as the slightly happier emergence of Safecast as a citizen science group, who've spent the last 10 years trying to get as many people as possible to be involved with environmental um, monitoring in their own towns, cities, villages, and backyards and of course promoting the publication of open data. So I'd like to at this point, however, take um, uh, ask everybody to Im invite you to take a moment to reflect in your own way about the events which led us here today 10 years ago in Japan. So if I can just um, ask for everybody to take a moment silence just to reflect on that please. Thank you very much. We hope that you've enjoyed the uh, Safecast ride, the event so far, and thank you so much, Asby. Um, you guys have had a sort of whistle-stop tour um, around Fukushima, visiting friends and colleagues uh, along the way. A huge thank you to um, the Safecast team based in Japan, not only in Fukushima, you saw the team there, um, various musicians and, uh, and, and friends and colleagues based in Tokyo, who've been doing a great job um, on the production so far. So we leave them uh, and uh, some of the colleagues in Fukushima enjoying a well-earned break, as I know they had a very late night and a very early start this morning. Um, hopefully they'll be celebrating and having just a, a cold drink, but we'll be back to catch up with um, uh, Asby, who I can see is enjoying a cold drink on the side there, um, Asby and Peter and some of those guys at the end of our round table. So now our Safecast Roundtable, um, we hope to have gathered together a range of fascinating guests, citizens, academics, scientists, engineers, advisors, and industry professionals, just to name a few. Each have their own area of expertise, um, and actually many of them hold many of those hats all together, so they might be anyone or any number of those, um, those things at the same time. So it's important to be able to get a wide range of uh, views and opinions on the different topics that we're going to cover. So we hope that um, our guests are gonna help us explore some key issues and themes that have emerged globally around the broad theme of citizen science and radiation monitoring. And over the next few hours, we'll be co covering a host of topics, which include how some organizations have become involved with Safecast and radiation monitoring and citizen science in general, whilst others have not. Transparency and ethics in radiation monitoring, radiation and mental health, Safecast's impact on policy and other international discussions. And then we'll round it off thinking about what good might look like if this were to happen again, um, unfortunately elsewhere. So our first session is going to be shepherded by my co-host Ian Darby and with him at the Safecast table. So um, if you're about to come on and I say your name, if I can ask you to turn your, um, your camera on. He has three guests, Dan Blumenthal, Peter Bossov, and Peter Kucher. They will be exploring over the course of the next uh, 50 minutes, the topic of measurement and data from citizen science devices. Um, Ian, I'm gonna hand over to you now, but I'll keep an eye on the questions. So I would encourage anybody who's watching on the uh, Safecast YouTube channel, if you um, are engaged with the session and have a question, please do remember to um, ask that and put it in the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on that. I know we also have some attendees um, and panelists um, in the audience on the Zoom call. You can of course um, use uh, the chat function here and the question and answer function um, on the Safecast uh, Zoom. So please do that. Ian, I'll be back over to you um, just before the end of the session with any of the questions that have come through. 
Thank you, Louise. I see that we are having some slight Zoom difficulties, so we're just going to have to take a minute or two to wait for Peter, Dan and Peter to manage to get their videos and microphones up and running. And if we can then have the, the spotlight on myself and the panellists. So there's Dan. Hi, Dan. It's spotlight. Get two. Uh, yep, there's Peter. Hello, Peter. We can't hear you yet. And we're just waiting on, on Peter, who I know is around. Hello. Do you hear me? Oh, yes. There we go. And uh, Ah, excellent. So, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Ian Darby. Uh, I've had uh, some interaction with Safecast over the years, much more since 2018 when I became a technical volunteer. Uh, I'm just going to take a second just to uh, quickly say a few words about our, uh, the panel and then they can introduce themselves when, when they further if they need to when the time comes for them to speak. So we have Dan Blumenthal, who is going to open the session for us. Dan is with USDOE and has got a really interesting history of interaction with uh, the events at Fukushima and thereafter. Uh, Peter uh, from the Czech National Radiation Protection Institute in Prague uh, has done, really done a, a, an extensive amount of uh, measurements with uh, the big eye and submitted lots of data. So if you look on the SafeCast map, which uh, Peter uh, has conveniently shown a zoomed in region uh, with lots of data, and you can see behind uh, both Dan and I, uh, the European map uh, and a rather funky layout showing so lots of the measurements that are made. So uh, the, the way that we're going to structure this conversation is uh, the, the title is Measurement and Data from Citizen Science Devices. Uh, basically, this starts with a measurement device, and then we go and collect some sort of trusted device. How do we collect the data? So the, the question in our mind as we're, as we're going to talk through this is uh, we would like to make better use of the data for official decisions. And therefore, what would it take for citizen science devices to collect data that could be used uh, in uh, an official capacity during emergencies and for other purposes. Peter Bossu, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yes, I can. Okay, uh, first of all, um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to, to for inviting me. Um, it's a great program, I really enjoyed it for the last hours. And well, it's up to I am now to ask the question and steer the discussion, actually. And uh, do you expect us to pre to present ourselves or...? Yeah, you can maybe just say a, a quick word or two about your history. We're, we're actually just waiting to see if Dan, if Dan manages to resolve any technical problems. It's still very faint, Dan. Is it, is it faint for everybody else? Yes, it is from my end. No, no, not much. A little. Sure. So, uh, of course, this was thoroughly tested a good half an hour beforehand, but gremlins like to strike when, when things look at, you know, uh, at the most opportune moment. Um, Peter, would you like to give a, a word or two of introduction about yourself? Uh, the <laughs> Uh, I have been working in the field of, do you hear me? Yes, I can. You hear me? Yeah, fine. So uh, I have been working for almost 40 years in the branch of radiation protection and special emergency preparedness and response on developing, both developing methods and to, uh, recommending equipment, measuring devices and so on, how to deal with them. Uh, five years ago, or maybe, maybe even seven years ago, uh, when the safecast devices became public available, we decided to uh, start a, a national wide program of, uh, say, improving knowledge and uh, of the public of on radiation uh, and in general, and especially radiation protection and uh, emergency preparedness. Because uh, we believe that what is the base is that uh, if, uh, if the people must, be, the public must believe you, and it's much better if the public believes you 
not because you are, a, say, only authority, but they believe you because they understand what you are telling them and they know the consequences. And they then it's not only blind or, or, or <clears throat> obey the orders, but understand and voluntarily obey the orders. Yeah. Yep. So I, th I think, Dan, are you back with us now? Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can We can hear okay, you now. So yeah. can, can we just no spotlight way. Dan again, please? Okay, so sorry for the technical difficulties, and uh, over to Dan to give the, 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 uh, the set in the scene for us, please. Okay, so uh, we uh, I'm from the U.S. Department of Energy, and we uh, sent a, a small team over to Japan uh, shortly after uh, March 11th. We arrived on the 16th of March, and our, our assignment was to make uh, wide area environmental measurements. Uh, we have specialized teams at the Department of Energy that can do uh, large scale aerial radiological surveys. So we, we mount large, very sensitive radiation detectors on aircraft. Uh, we used helicopters and airplanes in Fukushima that were from the United States Air Force that we work closely with. And, and we set about uh, making detailed measurements because you could see the, where the, the tsunami went and you could see the effects of the, the wreckage, but you couldn't see where the radioactive material was that was uh, released from the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. Um, and you could make individual measurements with survey meters, but that's like taking an initial look uh, under a microscope or you know, a telescope and, as opposed to just seeing the big picture. And we wanted to see the, the whole picture uh, quickly and, and safely. So I'll just show you, it's kind of like developing a picture. And initially we, um, this is the, after the first three days of, of measurements, our teams were um, down south near Tokyo. And then you can see Fukushima is up here and you can see where radioactive material was released and deposited on the ground uh, to the, the northwest of the power plant. So this, this uh, graphic was posted on the Department of Energy website uh, on March 22nd. So it was the first snapshot, kind of a crude snapshot of, of where the radioactive material was deposited uh, on the ground. And it was uh, initially um, used to refine the evacuation and, and relocation decisions uh, that the, the Japanese government was uh, you know, ha making. Um, so I said, it's kind of, this was the first picture and then over time, and this is a very large area. So you can see it, the, the most outer circle goes out to 80 kilometers. So over time we could fill in the picture or you could say, you know, develop it more, I'll move over a little bit. Um, as we, we collected more and more data, we could fill in the picture and you could see the extent of where radio material was deposited on the ground. And our, our task was to determine where the material was, how much there was, so you could determine if it was a hazard, if people had to relocate, um, and what kind of material, since different radioactive material um, is, is hazardous in different ways. Uh, whether it's you know, cesium, iodine, different radioactive materials uh, have different health concerns for the public and for the environment. And so this was also uh, posted on the DOE website for all to see and, and share. And, and by this time, so this was um, by the, the first week of April, and then we had uh, filled in the picture. This is kind of the, the final picture uh, that we did collectively with the Japanese government. So our counterparts, we both collected data. We had a joint team that collected and analyzed this data with uh, US technical teams of scientists and pilots, and then a Japanese technical team with their equipment and their aircraft. And we merged all the data into this map, which was then used to refine those uh, relocation decisions. And you can see up to the Northwest, uh, all the areas in yellow were determined to be where people had to uh, relocate and it was 
couldn't come back for it, at least uh, the first year. So after we uh, left, you know, measurements continued and uh, safe cast uh, continue, uh, there was, and you know, Ian and others will talk about when the, the timing of the safe cast measurements, but just to make a good segue into safe cast measurements, which were being developed in, in parallel and independently, but we took our data and, and shared it with the SafeCast team and they created it as a data layer in the SafeCast map. So this is just a screenshot from the SafeCast map today. You can go to the SafeCast website and there's a different layers of radiation measurements that you could see and you can turn off the SafeCast data and turn on this uh, DOE aerial survey data. And it shows that fully developed wide area picture. So it's, it's coarse uh, because we are flying a thousand feet over the ground, um, but it gives you that wide area picture relatively quickly compared to making all those individual measurements. That kind of sets the stage on, on the initial measurements and how that picture was developed of the radiological environment. So thank, thanks very much, Dan. I think that's, that's really informative and especially the fact that the SafeCast map has got the DOE data, uh, data layer in it. So obviously official data can be used by other people, but the other way around is a, seems to be a bit more challenging. Uh, so maybe we can first, you know, the, 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 are the devices really any different? So uh, perhaps I could ask Peter uh, if you would be, like to just uh, give some explanations into really what the difference between the big IG Nano that SafeCast used and what would otherwise be classed as an official measurement device. So would you like to start off that conversation, please, Peter? Uh, <clears throat> well, the, the, dif the main difference is not in the device. The device uh, used uh, the same physical principles, the say, <clears throat> a very, a very similar detectors, of course, the safe cast, uh, as uh, is, it was been built uh, for public use, so it cannot use the... <laughs> A high sophisticated selected electronics because it was it would be ter terribly expensive. But the SafeCast use the same Geiger Miller detectors as many of the <coughs> official detectors used uh, uh, and use very similar electronics. But what is important is the methods of measurement. In the official monitoring teams must have uh, approved uh, methods of measurement to get comparable results. But the SafeCast or the citizen monitoring use, uh, say, basically similar methods of measurement, but not on the base. You must do it exactly how it is in the methods. But please try to do it as close to the recommended me uh, methods as possible. For example, the official Measure, um, uh, method is measure one meter above the ground. The citizen monitoring method is measure uh, at, <coughs> as close as one meter above the ground as under local conditions possible. So the, this results into a much higher uncertainty of uh, the citizen monitoring results. Yeah? So it would it, so, so, we, so, yeah, so would anyone one, say that that's wrong? Pardon? Would, why, why would somebody say that that's wrong? I mean, it, you know, that it no, sounds no, to me it, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not saying it's wrong. It only says that it's not as precise as the, uh, as the measurements based on approved methods. And the result for this, say, not not hundred percent comparable is different conditions of measurements. So uh, the result is that you simply cannot uh, compare directly the numbers if the safe safe cast say twenty uh, uh, and the official uh, monitor uh, measurements say fifteen or twenty five or maybe in ten or thirty. It means it's it's comparable yeah? because you. The safecast say 20 plus minus not negligible. It's not, uh, it's not, not it's nothing against the safecast. The safecast can play, or the citizen measurement can play a very important role in the process of emergency preparedness because the capabilities of the monitoring, professional monitoring teams are limited. 
and the SafeCast can collect a lot of data, which can help in effective management of the exploiting of the professional teams. So that the professional teams will be sent to that places where it's really important to measure the data, not and not to the places where there the where the safeguard measurements prove that there is almost nothing. Or the safeguard measurements can uh, find some uh, uh, not expected higher values, which can be reason for sending them professional monitoring teams to approve it. Yeah? But basically, uh, only on the results of citizen monitoring, it's not possible to adopt any decision about protective measures, especially a real hard protective measures like relocation or and so on. No? So, okay. um, Peter, I was going to mention. Please, we I, I talked about the precision. Um, so the initial measurements that I showed. Um, there, there was a, uh, you know, un, a lot of uncertainty, uh, but we we calibrated so we knew the uncertainty, even if it was plus or minus fifty percent in the the beginning, but we knew what it was, and so we could um, inform decision makers that here's the number and it may be bigger or smaller. The the one thing about what, what Peter said is for the citizen measurements, they'll have some uncertainty, um, but we don't know what it is because there's both systematic and you know random un uncertainty. I mean, over time, it can probably be well understood. Uh, so, what's the range of how people will use the citizen measurement devices? And so we can get a good understanding of that. But it's the the sort of the uncertainty in the uncertainty because <laughs> we don't know exactly how the measurements are are made. So, I, I mean, the, the, you know, the way, the way the conversation goes there is, is the, the difference between the procedures and then, you know, it's, measurement science is easy when there's something to measure, but it's more difficult when it's not. So I'm just wondering if, Peter, you know, because I know your background is in the, uh, working with norm and, you know, naturally occurring levels. So, I mean, what what's really the good scenarios for using a device like SafeCast? I mean, the, the emergency response scenario, when there's something strong there to measure, you know, you can see why, you know, you'll get a response immediately from the device. But I mean, how far does this go? Is it the, the, a lot of the data in the SafeCast map is not from Japan, it's from other places. You are know, measuring what is effectively background levels. Is You know, you, you want to share any thoughts you have on using the, the SafeCast device and the data that's in the map for, for norm purposes? Uh, well, <coughs> I pay Peter Bosu, sorry. Uh, my, sorry, my bad pronunciation of Peter and Peter. Yeah, fine. I, so I was wondering, please, please uh, <laughs> distinguish clearly Peter and Peter. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> um, thanks, Arne. Well, uh, just to introduce myself shortly, I'm coming from theoretical physics and mathematics and statistics, actually. So I have a dif different approach, actually. I'm not a practitioner in that sense. Um, what are, interests me in this context is data interpretation. Um, you, you, you get a reading from the, from, from the PKIG. What is it? What does it stand for? How can you interpret it? Does it represent the objective situation at the point where you are standing or what is it? Uh, Peter, Petr <laughs> and Dan already addressed the, 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 the methods of precision. And Dan, Dan shortly spoke about accuracy, which is the systematic component, which is the nastier one, actually, because the precision, uh, which is the uncertainty, you know, can be traced to, to, to the, the instrument, it's the behavior of the instrument itself, plus its usage. And the usage of the instrument by, let's call them lay people, not professionals, this is a, this is a real problem because we do not know how to use it. So uh, do they, how do they carry it? You know, if, they, if, if, if you take the, the peak IG, can you see it? No, not really. The, 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 the default uh, orientation is this, but many people use it this way, where it has a very different response, for example, or somehow like this. So this is, uh, this, 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 this is a source of, of uncertainty which comes from the from the handling of the of the, of the device. 
And then you have the, 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 the accuracy issue, so the systematic component, because, it, because um, uh, the, 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 unfortunately, the PGIG is not very well characterized metrologically. So people measure, they get some, some values, but it's difficult to say what they are actually, because why we, we do not know about internal background, we do not know about cosmic response and things like this. Calibration is not documented very well and so on. So, so we have a lot of sources of, 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 of um, systematic uh, uh, uncertainty, which we try, we, you know, Petra and myself and, and colleagues, we are performing uh, experiments with the people PKG in order to, to, to find out about these co components, but it's, it's, it's a slow, it's it's slow and it's difficult. It's not easy, you know, and, and, and for, because because the, the the components are not very well characterized, you know, and and that's why it's so, it's really so Peter. So you you're saying what, what limitations does that place on using the data from these devices in, in an official capacity? Yeah. So if, if someone wants to make a, an actionable decision based on safe gas data, no, I, I would, I would I, 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 no, as Peter said, that this is very difficult, you know. What are possible decisions? Because you know, one objective of measurement, of using citizen science, citizen surveying, is to to confirm or to verify so-called official measurements. You know, so because there is, for good reasons, in some in some cases, there is distrust in mistrust in authorities, and people want to verify and confirm what what what, what they get. Uh, and and this is in the end a decision. What I measure does it conform to this? Uh, so-called official measurements or not, and this is a decision, yes or no. And this decision is very, very complicated. It's with, with the knowledge which we have about the behavior of the big Geiger, it's practically impossible. The second thing is if you if you do some measurements, as you see behind me, this is Berlin. This is a part of Berlin which is which you see behind me. Um, I used it for um, three years now. When did you give it to me, Peter? I don't know, three years or two years. I think something. some three three, three, three years, years ago. Yeah. And I have, I've been performing a lot of experiments in low radiation areas, you know, in order to see what, how it reacts really. And, and you see patterns, you know, if, if you look into the safe cast map, except, you know, Chernobyl or, or Fukushima, the most part of the world is just blue or, or dark blue or, or light blue. But if you look close, as, 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 in, as in not counting much, depends on your color scale. So what you mean is that there's a low count per second. All right, but 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 you see a pattern, but how to interpret the pattern? This is the real problem, because because and 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 this is really connected to the behavior of the instrument, and 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 this and and the and the the, the concept of preciseness and accuracy. You know, and this is I am afraid to say it's unresolved really. So I, I we've got a couple of interesting questions coming through to us from uh, from from YouTube. So please feel free to ask. Uh, there's a uh, someone Hubert Lalashi is. Is asking uh, Pe Peter from uh, Suro is trying to you know so I, can you give advice to people who have got a, a safe cast detect a big Aga or a, or a, a similar device to to improve their way of using the device so that their measurements are what you know in air quotes which I won't do because it's, you know it's silly but to make them more usable and it, you know he's got a follow on question is well, what's the difference between the you know what's the order of magnitude difference between the official devices and these home-built DIY devices. Just before you answer, I, I'll, I'll chip in myself. Remember, the components are the same. Where, where the discussion so far, I'm hope, I mean, hoping we'll go into a little bit more, is it's, as long as we understand the uncertainty, we can decide how we're using, whether the data that we've collected is fit for a decision we want to make. Uh, uh, neither the map, that, I mean, the map that's behind uh, Peter Bosu is, is not wrong, but it depends on what you're choosing to do with that map to make that decision. So I'll, I'll come back to, to Peter there just to, um, to to respond to the kind of advice on using the instruments. And, and maybe after Peter's finished, Dan, you can jump in. I think you have a comment you want to make. So please, Peter. Uh, well, uh, one of the, the main problem of uh, performing measurement on, by safe cast and norm, normal situation is that all uh, calibration we were able to find in the literature uh, do, do, not, do not use uh, those rates below some one or mostly two microsievert per hour, which are values which is in normal situation uh, not reached, never. 
Of course, there are some special areas in, in the uh, <coughs> Earth where there are some higher uh, natural background. But in Europe or even in Japan, uh, this, uh, not around Fukushima or not around Chernobyl, you will never meet more than about half microsievert per hour as, a, as the highest value. And we have no calibration data about uh, this low, low, dose, low dose rate region. So what we can do is only comparison of the safe cast with the uh, <coughs> professional, with or with other, other devices just in, just in the field. Uh, we have no possibility to compare the calibration. Yeah. But nevertheless, if you have performed a, a good amount of measurements, you can get a, some idea about how the situation in the region look like. And so based on this, you can uh, try to find some differences in, in case if, if something happened. Well, uh, by, by the way, during the five years or maybe seven I mentioned for our project with the public, Yesterday, we got uh, the, the number of uh, 6,000 uh, tracks provided to the SafeCast map just from the small country in the, in the middle of the Europe. Well, so, uh, but uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, I am telling this because uh, what I feel as a uh, main, uh, much important usage uh, of the SafeCast is for educa educating the public in the field of radiation and radiation protection. And be because if the people, uh, we provide the, uh, the devices to the people free of charge for a few months or so, they perform measurements, provide us data. And we always discuss, we have the basic idea, if you find anything, uh, in, say, interesting or maybe not expected, just, just first contact us and we will discuss with every user and uh, try to explain him what can be the reason for such higher values, what it can mean for his personally when he was in the place where it, where it was measured, what it can, what consequences it can, it could, it could mean for, uh, for the area. And my, my feeling is that uh, this is, uh, uh, rather successful because the, for the people, uh, for the lay people, it uh, starts not to be only a one number, which say, I don't know if, if the official limit is 20, so then it, uh, they, they understand that it does not mean that 19999 is perfect and 200001 is terrible and will kill you immediately, uh, not only you and all your, all your family and, and so on and so on. So, uh, I think that in this, in this field, the safe cast is really useful because the people can do, can uh, get insight into the measurement, can see, yes, okay, under normal situation, on the same place, I can measure such values or such values or uh, other, other, other values if there are in a sunny, nice day, other values if there is... A, uh, raining. Uh, we have we have a map of say interesting so, points so in the better. They can higher those rate. So this, uh, I think that this is the goal. What we can get, and of course, if something happens. Uh, better. I, I, I just want to catch you. Yeah, you, you I, said I, something there, but you, I just want to catch you so that, that, that it's to, to, to just not move away from the use of the detectors right now. You you said there something that was interesting. Perhaps Dan will comment on it. Is because it goes back to why SafeCast originally it came about, is that you know someone goes to a particular location and makes a measurement, and they're going to compare that measurement with what somebody else is telling them. And this is this, you know, it's the same business. Can can the detector be used for official purposes? But the the citizens are using the are using the do it yourself detector to decide whether or not they believe that the official measurement is true. And, and you know, I, I think. Uh, can Dan, can I ask you to, to jump in here because this is particularly you, you mentioned in the comments there, you know, just about the, 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 the lower uncertainties where there's higher, higher radiation readings. But I think, yeah. you know, this issue of individuals using their own detector the other way around so that they believe what the, what the official source is saying rather than us persuading the official them to use the, the citizen data. Right. So even in our measurements, and I put back to the initial map that we created, uh, the the rates were, were relatively high. And so there were many effects that in normal environmental 
background surveys that we do, you have to worry about a lot of low level effects, whether it's you know radon or cosmic rays um, and all sorts of uh, minor corrections. But with the, the higher rates, those effects were small. So the, the picture that we were having you know, gave a good representation. And same with the save cast, like uh, Peter showed, you know, different orientation of the detector. When you have the, the much higher uh, rates, then I think the, those efficiencies and uh, field of view uh, issues are, are smaller, um, um, at least in a, you know, relative sense. So for these initial situations, you know, after emergency where there's, um, you're worried about health. I think the, the, you know, official measurements as you're calling them and the citizen measurements probably are just going to be closer because any differences in the, the systematics or other uncertainties will just be small compared to the absolute number that you're measuring. And then like for example, the SafeCast map that I showed earlier, the the DOE data and the SafeCast data, I mean, they're, they're very consistent. Uh, so that, that's also a, a good takeaway message. I mean, so, uh, yeah. Peter, please. Yeah, this, this is of course true if, you, if you're talking about high dose rates, as you have in the Fukushima zone or in Chernobyl. Following an emergency, yes. If, yeah, in, you know, in these situations, as you because as you correctly said, it, in the limit of high dose rates, you know, the systematic components, they, they disappear. But it's not so in, 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 in low dose rate areas. And, and as right. a matter of fact, most of, of safe cast readings, they come from low dose areas, as, as you can see behind me, for example, you know. And people, that this is what I hear, people try to interpret this data. So, so and, and, and then I just can repeat my, I can only repeat my question. What does it, if you have a reading, say, 105 uh, micro sievert, uh, nano sievert per hour. This, this is what, what, what the instrument says. How does it relate to the objective true situation in the point where you are sitting? And this is a very non-trivial question because if you, if, you, if you do it very professional, you will find probably not 105, but you find 75. So, which is correct. And, 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 and I mean, I, I'm not going into this uh, discussion because this would be a lecture of one week actually, but, 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 but so, so I, I, promise, <laughs> I promise to I am that not going into physics here, but, 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 but I, I just want to say that it's not trivial, this, this question. So if you get, if, because people tend to believe if you have this nice instrument, they have a reading and they tend to think that what it says is, the, is, 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 is an accurate plus minus some, some statistical fluctuation of the, of the objective true dose rate. And this is not true. And, 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 and at the moment, unfortunately, we do not have any recipe about this. We can just say, be, be careful with this data. And, and, yeah, uh, maybe it's not a very positive <laughs> well, you know, I message, but it's it, 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 a fact, you know. I, I think, I mean, uh, you know, I, th I think it's certainly true. I can, you know, uh, so just to participate is, is, is what my response would, to that would be is, is you know, I, 105 and 75, I say that's the same thing because, it's, you know, uh, I think what's really important yeah. is, and, and if any of my uh, colleagues, I, 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 I'm often called, you know, Mr. Uncertainty is I always like a number with an uncertainty because that tells me what I can use the number for. Uh, and I think some of these instruments are, 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 are valid for these purposes. I always come back to the fact that it's it's built in, you know, it's the same kit. It's it, we're, we're talking about the differences between the, the reproducibility of using it and, and people having confidence in it. But the the, the basic components of the of the safe cast detector are the same basic components of a number of different instruments that you can buy that have a pancake sensor probe in them. It's it's you know whether they're handled correctly and whether somebody else can pick up the instrument and go to the same place and measure the same thing in a reproducible manner that leads you to have confidence in, in the signal. The, this, you know, I like to be a physicist, come back to, I want to measure something in the real world and I want it to tell me something about the real world. And um, we're, 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 we're cracking through time. So I, I'd like to, you know, the, 
uh, earlier at, at the very start of this, uh, and if anyone is not, you know, didn't wasn't up, you know, very early in the morning to see the the, the lovely uh, announcement of the Airnote, um, you know, there's new devices coming out. Uh, the big Aggies getting to be, able, you know, it's, it's it's an older device now, and there's new electronics and different ways of doing things. So the the question I've got is, you know, if we're doing, you know, that, you know, God forbid that anything that should happen like this again, but uh, if we wanted to create uh, maps and use the maps, Peter, for the low, say the collecting background, and I know Peter Kutcher talks about this. One of the advantages of the system is to can we collect the data before the emergency so that you you know you've got a large large well of data to be able to use. So what do we have to do with the citizen science approach to the data that we can tag it with a quality assurance process that says to the bigger audience, well, here you've got this resource and this is what you can use it for. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I open that up as it's, if we're, for, for going forward to the future, you know, you know Ray announced, uh, you know, AirNote and there's going to be a version of AirNote that's got a Geiger tube in it. So what, what do the citizen scientists want to do from the outset to get themselves a quality assurance process that means that they can hand that data over and we're going to touch on this several times during the day in different conversations. So uh, I, I, maybe Peter, I'll start with you as to, as to go back to it. What do you think a good quality assurance process for this data looks like? Which Peter? Yeah, yeah. You, that, 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 uh, yes, you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I, I would say that the the. the um, actually, I, I mean, uh, because I, I was a bit negative before, I like the big Geiger because this is a great, you know, it's, it's a great achievement, really, in spite of all its deficiencies, it, it, which it has. But it's 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 the best, which is on the market actually for for on affordable options. But um, I, I think the first message is that, that people should measure. Uh, according to some rules, which means, as Peter said before, one meter above ground and the instrument vertical, so the, 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 the axis of the, of the pancake horizontal. So this is the first thing. Uh, 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 I think this, this is the most important. The, the second thing, this is the data, the interpretation of what comes out. And we, we, we cannot give recipes because uh, um, first you, you, you cannot e easily correct the data to something which is objectively true. Because it depends on the altitude above sea level, it, it depends about air pressure, it depends on, 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 on I, I don't know what, you know, and and the geomagnetic latitude and um, certain things. So, so we, we, we are working on this really. So maybe in a year or two, we will be able to 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 give some 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 easy simple formula. What can you do? How, how do you reduce this this measured value? to some objective value. But at the moment we can't, I'm afraid. You're on mute, Ian. No, I know, yes, I get the t-shirt, I'm on mute. Um, so I can see Louise Chippenham from the side. A, a important thing I, I forgot, so accuracy and uncertainty, but it's in reference to standards, you know, there are, there are official guidance as to the decisions that can be made about uh, different pieces of data. So, I mean, objectivity is, is is, quote Louise is very is depends on the exact situation. Uh, we are we are almost out of time before, before we can kind of wrap up to move on. I'd just like to uh, quickly uh, flick over to Peter and to uh, Dan. You know, is that you know on the on the general theme of you know measurement uh, the measurement and the data from citizen science devices. You know, uh, what's your what's your what's your parting thoughts that you'd like people to leave this session with? I have a short note. Yeah, please. Yeah. Well, it, it, it would maybe sound like advertising. Well, uh, in one of our projects, we are developing uh, something like a new ver Czech version of SafeCast, which will be used most of the basic principles of SafeCast, the similar detector, the same case, the same data format, but a bit improved the GPS module and a few other uh, few other. Uh, features. Uh, we expect that we will be able to produce some one, one, about 1,000 such units in next two or three years. And uh, 
the Soviet expect we will distribute them in the Czech, mostly in the Czech Republic to citizens to say some volunteer fire, fire brigades, major of small villages, and so on and so on. So we will improve uh, the num number number of measurements, and maybe we will we can you, you in this process we can uh, perform some work in the field of calibration and quality assurance with uh, on a say. Uh, <laughs> A rather large basis of devices, not only one or two. Uh, by the way, I have heard some rumors from GitHub that the distribution of the Safecast Baby Nano will be almo uh, almost stopped. Do you know something about it? I, I don't, but I suspect this was the right place to ask that question. There'll be a flurry of answers uh, on various uh, chat channels that are. I, I, I'm not going to look to my computer at left, I'm sure it's a uh, is lighting up on fire, but uh, I, I, in the interest of time, I think I, I, if, 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 it's very interesting to hear the, the, the project that you're talking about there, uh, Peter, but uh, can, I, can I just uh, throw over to Dan just to, to hear your uh, kind of, you know, remarks at the end, please? Sure. Um, you know, if we look at the, the map behind Peter, I mean, I think one of the strengths of the citizen measurements, if something were to happen, is I think from a response perspective, not the normal background measurements, um, but if something were to happen in a location, then you do have some existing background to compare to, but also if something were to happen, then you can have citizen measurements occurring immediately before any official measurements can be made. So official decisions can start, you know, to get a decision makers can start to get a sense of what the environment looks like, you know, what they're up against because our measurements were relatively rapid, but still took a lot long time to, to get that picture that you see behind me. So the citizen measurements can be there you know, rapidly and also set the stage for you know, comparing before and after. Is, even if they do have uncertainty, as we've all talked about, um, presumably that if they, they measure some background and then they measure something afterwards, you know, you're, it's a comparison. So you'd be, uh, you know, maybe factoring out some of the systematic uncertainties. You're just looking at a ratio, like how much worse is it after an incident versus before? So they, they have, a, you know, a couple of good strengths, I think. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, we, 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 yeah, please. Peter. No, I, I, I agree with this, you know, and this is, this is one of the strengths of citizen monitoring that you can produce lots and lots and lots of data, as also Petra said in the beginning, you know, which, are, which, which an institution is never able to do, of, of course, you know, in this amount. But, but uh, so, so this, this is really the, the, the benefit of such system and this is the, the, the great achievement, really. So I appreciate that. Um, and it can be used um, somehow as a comparison before and after, you know, because, you know, whether, because, the, 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 you know, in, in, in statistical language, this, this, this um, uh, amounts to signal detection, you know. Whether you have a signal or not, and 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 deciding about the presence of a signal in a in a data set, this is a quite, as you probably know, not so easy unless the signal is so strong that it's ab above any doubt. It's beyond doubt, then it's easy. But but if you have weak signals, then 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 it's difficult. And if you, if you if you for example if you go into the the safecast map and you zoom into Berlin or this is in particularly East Berlin which is what you see behind me, you will, will find a number of anomalies really, which I which I found when I, I I did this by bicycle actually this is my my sport so to say I I, I mounted on the bicycle and then I <laughs> during the during the lockdown. Uh, uh, season I, I I cycled to Berlin in order to just to map Berlin. And and uh, I did find a lot of anomalies, and you will see it if you if you zoom into the map, you will, will see it. And we we we, we, we actually we, we were looking for what was happening there, and we found the reasons in, in most cases. But but um, uh, st still still I'm, I I would warn against uh, um, uh, interpreting the numbers to to. As a truth, in that sense, you know, it, it is a qualitative indication, but it's not the truth. In the, I mean, you, you would have to go really very much into statistics in order to, 
to 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 to, to explain this correctly, but which we cannot do. But uh, it's just a warning, really. Maybe I I, I may add a, a, an almost trivial remark to Petro before. Uh, the big the big guy, unfortunately, it has no CE certificate, as you know. So therefore, formally, it is well, illegal. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm in the UK now, so I'm not going to talk about CE certificates. So just, no, but at least, you know, what it means <laughs> that it's formally illegal to import into the European Union, really, because it has no CE certificate. Yeah, um, so, yeah, in, so uh, China, I, I'm going to I'm going to have to I'm going to have to I'm going to I'm going to step in now because we're, we're, I've got I, I've been given the nod and I've, we've got a few minutes and we're going to we're, we're, and we're going to keep this in time, so we are good chair. Um, so there was there was just kind of two things I I, I wanted to pick out. One thing we haven't really talked about, uh, and actually somewhat remiss of us, is the strength of so many measurements being made. I mean, I think one of the things that the Safecast map talks about is you know, it was 160 million plus measurements. But however you count this, uh, one of the challenges that always came back to Safecast that I heard was you know malicious actors, misuse of data. Someone you know t- measuring with a source, or because they misuse the detector, you get a hotspot when none exists. I don't think there's particularly you know there are anomalies in the map, but the anomalies tend to show up something that's true. Uh, true, although Louise will tell me off for saying what is truth. You know, you see X-ray detectors. You see, uh, I think in the map you can see where people go into museums and the the, the detector is still left on and passes through an X-ray scanner. But in general, there's so many people and so many measurements being made that actually. The, where there may be noise on truth, uh, the true picture does emerge. It is, it, the signal is in there to see, and it can it can be extracted and used. Um, because we've got a chat channel going as well, I have the, I can see the thing from from Dan, and actually I think you should you should say this out loud, Dan. Is you know, uh, let's you know thinking about uh, what the what the future is. So I I will I can see Louise, so that's my, my prompt. But I think I'm going to give the last word of this session to Dan, and maybe you can. Uh, expose the thought that you put in the chat channel there, please. Sure, I thought of it since someone asked if the the V Geige, you know, itself was going away. So, and and Petter talked about building a new and improved system. So maybe the future of you know citizen science at, at the Safecast level isn't the actual hardware, but you know, talk, the the methods, the data management, quality control standards that we've been talking about here. So if we you know, promulgate those worldwide, then anybody, it's just like, you know, all cell phones, right, you know, talk to each other, it doesn't matter who made it. So we come up with some standard or, or guidance standard sounds too prescriptive for citizen science, but some guidance so we can all be interoperable and, and share whomever makes the, the actual piece of hardware. So thanks, Dan, and you can see we're being ushered towards the door. So, but, but, but I'm going to I'm going to claim my two and a half minutes. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Peter, uh, Peter, and Dan very much for participating in this discussion. It's where you can t- you can probably tell we've enjoyed doing it. I hope everybody else uh, that observes it. If, there, if there's anybody out there and we're not just talking into the void, uh, also enjoyed it. Uh, you will notice from the program several of these themes will come back uh, again. Particularly Dan and I will be back together at the end, thinking about what the future looks like. Uh, and think, you know, uh, uh, should such an incident happen again? And some of the some of these same themes on the use of the data and what it can be there will will reemerge. Uh, there were some questions, uh, particularly relating to education and uh, how people react to the detectors. What I would like to say is we have a particular session later on the citizen science, where you hear from Marco Zanaro, uh, and part of that we'll be talking about a really, you know, uh, I'm wearing the bad this badge for it. Uh, a fantastic school that was run uh, in 2017. And uh, throughout this afternoon, you'll see little snippets of things called Safecast Stories. Actually, those stories have been put together by the student participants of the ICTP school in the main. Uh, and so to the person who asked, you know, what was the reaction of, of students to getting hold of the detectors? Uh, I would like to say, watch Marina's video from Armenia, because she really shows, she, she gives it to a new bunch of students and you can see the kind of joy uh, uh, that they have at getting, at getting hold of a device and being able to go and make measurements from themselves. So as it says 11.59 and I must be less than 60 seconds from finishing, uh, thank you very much everyone for this session and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, and I think I hand over to Louise again now. So thank you and cheerio. Oh. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Peter, Peter, uh, Dan, and Ian, for some fantastic uh, conversation going on there. I can see we have one, one question in the Q&A on the Zoom. So actually, um, you guys are going to stay on as, as panelists for a short while, but I, I would ask if you can answer that using the Q&A function. That uh, would be fantastic. Um, thanks, Ian, for doing a fantastic job in terms of um, fielding the questions. 